This is Josiah Plays Torment, Tides of Numenera. So we are here doing the Indigo Mirror. And if you'll recall, Indigo is the tide of the greater good. Right? The good for the most people type of type of uh, stuff. Justice and 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 uh, You know, it's not the the gold tide is the one that's like compassion for individuals and like and like being kind to people and stuff. But indigo is more complicated. It's more like it's more like the you know societal level kind of good that we're looking at for indigo. And that's clearly what this that's clearly what this uh, story in the in the mirror is about. So let's look at our seven options here. There must be some other way. What if it fails? Yeah, see, number three, I don't get it. No one would permit such a crime against a child. Shut up. No, number three. Get out of here with that shit. I need healing first. No, don't be a jackass. Um, number five, number six. Kill the would-be child slayers and disable... Okay. No. <laughs> or destroy the Numenera with your concussive crystal. Why would I do that? I don't understand why I'd destroy the Numenera. What would be my end game there? Alright, no. Let's start with number one. There must be some other way to stop the disease. For a few moments, the speaker says nothing, and when she answers, her voice is composed. You will recognize, I trust, that I would not likely speak of killing a child if there were some better way before us. What if the procedure fails? You'll have killed the only one of your people immune to the disease. The speaker shakes her head. We are not fools, stranger, and long have we pondered our few choices. Even if the gift survives, the folk shall die, for he cannot speak the word and keep our ways alive she nods to the chirurgeon and the healer knows his craft and his tools he has said this will not fail and I speak his words again with confidence all right I guess we're going with number three we're just gonna do it we're just gonna do it honestly let's look at it like this the child is mute. First of all, they're all going to die if they don't do this, right? They're all going to die. They're all going to get the plague or they're going to get blown up by cannons. Period. One of those things that has to happen at this point, basically. So, there's no point to saving one of them if all of them are going to die. Secondly... The boys mute, and their culture is all about the spoken word. Everything about passing on their culture and people knowing their place and everything is based on the ability to speak. And so as a mute, he's going to have a shitty life in their culture anyway. Now, he could be taken out of here if you wanted to just save this boy and let all the rest of them die. You could save him and take him back to Sega's Cliffs. And then what do you do with him? He's just going to be some homeless street orphan that can't talk? That's going to be fun for him. Um, and you already let all the other people die. So that's a shitty outcome. That's idiot compassion, as I call it. Well, I didn't just make that up. There's, um, it's, that's a term that's used by some spiritual teachers. Idiot compassion, where you let this, your soft heart lead you to what you think is a compassionate and kind action or outcome but really what it is is just a bad idea it's just it's just weakness it's just you know not looking at the big picture and ultimately you're not actually doing something compassionate there trying to save that one boy from these people while letting all the rest of them die is idiot compassion i'm not doing it so this is my justification for killing a kid. And now we're going to kill the kid. Very well. The survival of your people is more important than the boy's life. She spoke the truth. 
When the boy is broken upon the kite... Now they're gonna make it sound all horrible, right? When the boy is broken upon the chirurgeon's bench, when ciphers bore into his back, he makes not a noise, because he can't. From his life, twenty-three will be saved, each with an amber promise swirling in a strong glass vial. The healer hands one to you, along with a cipher that will inject it into the whale singer. The speaker gives you a flag, half yellow, half blue. Wave it when you reach the shield. We will open a way, and the singer will know you for a friend. With that, the folk speak a word of blessing and lead you to a tunnel dug through whale flesh. They're not exactly being very nice to this whale, though, are they? I mean, let's think about the whale's needs here. Maybe letting all of them die would be best for the whale. It could, you could cut this bullshit off the back of the whale and it could go on about its life. But maybe the whale enjoys what it does with them. Maybe it has a relationship with the whale singers and it feels satisfaction from it. I don't know. Just don't know. But what I do know is... We're going through some whale flesh tunnel right now. That will give you a clear start. Your path will not be easy. The village is overrun, but it is the only way. So you go. Back to the whale. Color around your neck hums and a voice warns, Make haste! The whale has entered the bay! You heed its command. As you weave through the narrow paths and alleys, faint sounds stir in the silence. The shuffle of footsteps, the huffing of quiet breaths. No, the huffing of heavy breaths. And a watchful eye and quiet tread. With a watchful eye and quiet tread, you advance, keeping out of sight as best you can. Soon they are before you, a gang of unspeakables, at least a dozen strong, making their starving, reaving way through the village and unknowingly barring your advance. Modest as their weapons may be, it would be folly to try and fight them. You're not here to cleanse the haven, sneak past them. Yeah, let's sneak past. The same hovels that make a maze of the full haven provide endless cover for the adept. Slipping through doors, slinking through alleys, and leaping from roof to roof, you evade the unspeakables and make your way at last to the Howdah. You reach the top of the whale's head and stand before the shimmering force field that shields the Howdah. A wave of the blue and yellow flag brings it down. Within the pavilion stands a stocky man, barrel-chested and ruddy. The whale singer. Now looking at that image right there... He does not look barrel-chested and ruddy. But, you know, artistic license. The Whale Singer. He seems pleasantly surprised to see you. Behind him, wide-mouthed tubes rise up from the whale's hide and past them is the flat expanse of the whale's brow. Not so far beyond are the cliffs, the cannons, and the city. The whale singer's voice booms when he speaks, his words accented like the speaker's. I do not know you, stranger, but you have braved the unspeakables and come bearing the speaker's blessing. I await your words. How do you steal the whale? Steer. Why would I trick him into turning the whale without giving him the inoculation, though? He is like the most important person of their, of their society. He definitely should be one of the ones that's getting inoculated. How do you steal... How do you steer... Why do I keep saying that steal? How do you steer the whale? The whale singer waves a hand at the trumpet-like bronze tubes rising from the creature's hide. When I sing, these salpinges bear my song into her very brain, stirring the nerves within as if my voice were her own. What I sing, she must do. He kneels and places a hand on the huge head beneath him. It is a duty and an honor to join the Great One's mind. I soothe her loneliness and hold her back when the males roar their lust through the seas. Thus have I, and the many singers before me, kept Folkhaven from sinking below the waves. Tell me more about the whale. The whale singer shakes his head. Each whale singer teaches his craft to a song student, who will in turn live to become singer himself. Sadness steals over his face. 
Though the student is gone, you are not of the folk and cannot take his place. Here's the inoculation, bro. You quickly explain what the healer has given you and hand the inoculation to the whale singer. He presses the needle through his skin, blending the serum with his blood. There is no change or wonderment worked by the injection. No esoteric lies behind this treatment, merely a child's life. All the same, the whale singer nods and thanks you. You have safeguarded my song, and thus the haven. You must turn the whale before it's destroyed. With a gesture to the cannons bristling on the not-so-distant cliffs, you warn the singer of what will come if the whale is not turned. Trusting in the speaker's flag and the clear truth of your words, he gives a quick nod and turns to the tubes rising from the whale flesh. It is an uncanny song he sings, inhuman at the same time heart-achingly intimate. And once the whale begins to turn, heaving its huge bulk away from the city and back to the open seas, and then the song ends, and the whale singer takes a long swig from a flask chained to his belt. It is done! Seconds later, the collar around your neck flickers, and a voice whispers, to you alone, Do not let it turn back. I'm not going to kill him to ensure that the whale will not be turned back. That's just as bad as fucking shooting the whale with cannons, basically. Tell me more about the whale? He merely shakes his head. Alright. I'm done. I'm done here. We're not killing him. And we're not doing anything else. Turning to my dahow. You race down the whale's head and leap into your dow. With a swift slash, you cut the harpoon loose. Moments later, the whale is already dwindling into the distance. Whatever fate awaits the folk and the unspeakables, it will be resolved at sea, far from the city you were sent to protect. As you slip from its shadow, the indigo waves turn azure. Your collar trembles and the voice returns. You should have cut deeper. Then, silence. And listen, fuck you, collar voice. The wind bears you back toward home. Do not bother to watch the vanishing whale with a dying village on its back, for ahead of you grows the great city of Sagus Cliffs, its buildings, then its people coming slowly into view. They are safe for now. And Sagus Cliffs looks cool from this view. Alright, I handled it. I'm pretty pleased with how that went down. All right, another mirror complete. Let's um, talk to Kian, I guess. It seems to be the next order of business. Let's go all, you and me. I tend to lay your head, food and tails from afar included. A woman, barefoot and in rags, stands defensively beside her tent. Despite her obvious poverty, she crosses her arms and holds her chin high. What do you want? Who are those people who ran off? She points her chin in the direction of the tunnel that leads out of the courtyard. They're called Downey and Vrung. They've been squeezing money out of me for months. Protection, they call it, though obviously they only mean from them. I wish I could do more than simply cave to their demands, but as you can see, I'm not exactly equipped to defend myself. It's all I can do to survive. This sounds like a quest! Give me a quest. I'll go handle this shit. Give me a quest. They'll be cleaning up pieces of Delny and Vrung for days. How often do they steal from you? Too often. I barely have enough to feed myself, and then they take what's left. Usually more than what's left. Why not call the guards? 
This is a joke. This is a joke answer. Hearts? You mean the Memavira's thugs? All they do is guard her interests and extort money from the gangs. They don't keep order unless you can pay them. That's the way of the bloom. Delny and Vrung can do as they like, as far as anyone else is concerned. Do you have any money left? Enough to get by. Her eyes suddenly narrow. I can rob her?! Oh my god, that's a dick move! Why, you're not thinking of protecting me as well, are you? You're wasting your time. I have nothing left. <laughs> Give me whatever money you have or you'll regret it. Oh my god, you can be such a dick if you want. That's evil. That's not what I meant. I wanted to make sure you're going to be alright. Of course you did. She studies you before saying more. I'm alive. I suppose that qualifies as alright. Still, I wonder how long I can remain so with those two at my throat. Quest, give me a quest. I'll remember that. Quest received! Alright, now I'll go murder some people. Because hashtag, I had a quest. Remember that time when I snapped that dude's neck in dialogue? That was cool. They crawl out of a hole somewhere deeper in the bloom. Little Niliesh, I think it's called. I'm not the sort to wish violence upon anyone, even people like them. But I hope something happens to stop them. I'm going to look at her closely. You notice immediately that her rags are actually made of a high-quality fabric. It appears that they were once a fine green dress, green dress or gown, though it is now filthy and torn. She catches you looking and straightens her posture, seeming almost regal for a moment. Okay, so she wasn't always poor. She came for money, and she's fallen on hard times. Can you tell me again about Delny and Vrung? I think they're from Little Nihilesh, but I've never gone there. It's a slum full of mutants, and the residents don't like normal humans. I'm afraid that's all I know. Okay, looking around this place, if you're calling some other place a slum, holy shit, that place must be bad. Because we're pretty much in a slum right here. Tell me about yourself. She gives a weak smile and curtsy. My name is Kian. The Bloom's most pitiable storyteller and self-styled innkeeper. Though I admit that inn is far too fine a word from my little tent. Still, it can provide a meal, a bedroll, and at least a modicum of entertainment in the form of tales from my homeland. Alright, that sounds legit. Before I came here, I was a noblewoman, believe it or not. A courtier from Sturthal. She gets a faraway look in her eyes. Feels like a previous life. I wonder if I'll ever find my way back. She shakes her head. I suspect not. You tell me about yourself again. I'm a teller of distant tales, keeper of this little tent where you may rest your head, and formerly a noble lady of Sturthal, but alas, no more. Okay, well, it sounds like you've come down a lot in the world. Which, in a bizarre way, I congratulate you for. Because you will learn so much from this, and you will grow in ways that you cannot even understand. And you already have been. You already are. You're becoming a whole new version of yourself. A stronger, wiser, tougher, more compassionate version of yourself than you ever would have in your pampered life of luxury and privilege. So, congratulations. Good luck making it work for you, though. Because you could also get shanked to death any, any day, but, you know, let's not, let's not focus on the negative. Um, how did you get here? Did you come through a sphincter? You've seen the Katina, I assume. 
She gestures broadly at the massive broken vehicle behind her, being slowly subsumed by bloom flesh. Oh, is that a vehicle? It's a kind of magical carriage, capable of traveling great distances by skipping over the space in between. Governor Marazek's priest determined that it came through Sturthal on a very precise schedule. It would appear at one of a few locations near Sturthal every 73 hours. A three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. So this is like a trans-dimensional Gilligan's Island situation. Well, among the nobles, it became a sort of adventure. We would dare one another to board the Katina or even hold parties at a location where it was scheduled to appear. It was exciting. I knew people who went on such journeys and came back with the most wonderful tales. They'd spend a couple of days meeting strange, fascinating people and visiting wild locales. Some, I'm fairly certain, were not even in the Ninth World. I had to see for myself. That does sound fun, admittedly. I'd want to go on that. So about a year ago, my friends and I threw a Katina Gala in anticipation of its arrival. We packed and dressed for adventure, and when the carriage arrived, we boarded immediately. She clasped her hands in front of her and sighs. Sadly, that was the Katina's final journey. It crashed here, tunneling through part of the bloom. Most of the passengers were killed in the crash, and the rest in the months since. I am all that's left of that voyage. Well, that sucks. Of all the places that you could crash, Into the Bloom seems like about the worst possible place. I mean, or one of the worst. That's not good. And now she's here being poor and desperate and harried and trying, just trying to make it through. Just trying to make it through. Ooh, ooh, child. Things are going to get easier. Ooh, ooh, child. Things will get brighter. Quote, the Tupac song. All right. Well, you are a very strong person to have survived for so long. I never considered myself strong. If I was truly strong, I might have kept the others alive, too. He sighs. <sighs> Thank you. How did you get here again? Are you an idiot? <laughs> My friends and I boarded the Katina about a year ago. She waves a hand toward the crash vehicle behind her. It was supposed to be a brief adventure, but it has turned into something else entirely. I am all that's left of our little expedition. What happened to the others? Did you eat them? Did somebody eat them? Where's Sturthal? Hundreds of kilometers from here, from what I've learned. As I understand it, the Bloom is located in what we in Sturthal call the Beyond. Or actually, beyond the Beyond, as I had never heard of the Sagus Protectorate or any of the places people talk about here. Sturthal is one of the largest cities in the Steadfast. It perches on the edge of an enormous rift in the ground called Voyal Chasm. Some streets and buildings even protrude from the cliff sides, not unlike your Sagus Cliffs as I understand it. It's a cultural jewel in an otherwise war-torn nation. Here's what I don't get. Why don't you leave the Bloom and go to Sega's Cliffs? It's not, I don't think people are trapped in here, are they? There's, there's a path, there's a road that goes back and forth between them, and it's not very far away. I would think she'd be able to make something work for herself better in Sega's Cliffs, but maybe she can't for some reason. Maybe the Memo Vera won't let people leave, unless they pay a certain hole or something and she can't afford it I don't know what I do know is I'm gonna do her quest I'm gonna do it with with prejudice all right I don't want to sleep here I mean where you from again I'm from the steadfast it's civilization not like the beyond or even this place beyond the beyond Though perhaps Sega's Cliffs might be comparable, and I come from one of the steadfast largest cities, Sturthal in the nation of Malavik, perched on the infamous Voil Chasm. Sounds interesting. Love to go there someday. Farewell.
Farewell, madame. Alright, let's look at the old journal. Main quest is Dracogen's price. I've arrived in the bloom, seeking the first cast off. Dracogen, a self proclaimed information broker, suggested that I speak to the Memavira, who rules the bloom. If the first cast off is truly alive and hiding here, the Memavira would know. Unfortunately, meeting the Memavira face to face is out of the question without a proper introduction. Dracogen would be happy to provide this introduction if I procure an item called the Magmatic Annulet for him. Go to the trade post. Dracogen told me to follow the caravan route from the Memavira's courtyard to the trade post. That's where I'll find a maw that will take me to the Ascension. Secondary quest, Broken Hearts. Tabir's past is waiting for him in the predatory darkness of the bloom. Bring Tabir to Dracogen. Dracogen wants me to reunite him with Tabir, his old friend. Twice the trouble. Yan, a refugee who lives in the Memavira's courtyard, is being harassed by a pair of thugs. I offered to help her deal with the problem. Find the thugs who have been harassing Kian. Two thugs are named Delny and Vrung, and they're hiding in the slum of Little Nail Naliesh. Little Niliesh. I should track them down and have a talk with them. Talk needs to be in quotes. I talk with my dagger! I need to grab Tabir and bring him up in here. Mirkaster is quiet and unresponsive. It seems there's no way to access it again. That's fine. It's, it's just going to get turned into money then. Turned into money, money, money. It's good because we're pretty low on money right now. All right. So this is the... This massive vehicle appears to have crashed through the nearby wall. Bloom flesh has resealed the hole and is beginning to grow across the vehicle's surface. You recognize the vehicle as a Katina, a hyperdimensional transport from a prior world. Cool. Oh, oh, she's a refugee. I see your face, I see you staring back at me. A U2 song. Um, Alright, so let's go ahead. Before we do anything else, we go, then. let's do this Tabir thing. So, what I need to do is kick somebody temporarily out of the party. And you know who somebody's gonna be? It's gonna be Alagurn. He's always my kind of go to get kicked out person. Oh, I have as much health as Alagurn now, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Because he had a lot more than me in the beginning. What? Of course, he's not tier 4 yet. When he hits... Oh, yeah, he is tier 4. Really? What did he get at tier 4? No, I'm looking at myself. He's not tier 4. So he'll have more to, than me when he hits tier 4. She still has 19. Poor little girl. Alright. So, I think I need to kick out Alagurn real quick. Get Tabir in here, summon him with the Bronze Sphere. Curses his lips, but says nothing. I want to talk about you and your story again. Not exactly my favorite topic. Fine, ask. Mm -hmm. I had other questions. How are you holding up? Fine, appreciate you asking. I wonder if this has changed. You think of Makina again. Okay, same stuff he said before. So you need to go. Here I thought we were getting along so splendidly. The irony in his voice is betrayed by the hurt in his eyes. I won't be staying here, that's for certain. I don't imagine we'll be crossing paths again anytime soon. I've got a way to contact you if I need you. Farewell. So long. I always feel like I'm hurting their feelings so badly when I kick them out. I'm not safe yet. Not by a long shot. I don't remember if I told you this, but I was born here. Born in the bloom. It's rough. 
struggles to hide the fear that shivers through her frame. You can feel the tight control she maintains over her emotions, over her tides. She swallows hard, woke up in the process of being devoured. I suppose the bloom saw our sire's mind leave. Dropped me, newborn, and I got out. Fled up to Sega's cliffs, and that thrice-damned sorrow almost snatched me then. Her voice drops almost indistinct. I left the city, stole and hurt people on the way out, but at least I got away. So, you know what happened with the cast-offs, but the first, damn her. Let's be sure to kill her when we find her. Anyway, the bloom. After the trouble with Melmoth, I wound up here, in the service of the man who became the Memavira, the old boss of this place. Listen to me. The Bloom rewards cruelty and pain. It will react to your actions. So, be careful. The current Memavira and I don't get along too well. Be aware there's a history. A bloody one. I can't promise I'll be civil around her. She adjusts her cloak. Alright, let's go. Oh, I'm, this is interesting. Let's find out more. You said the me you and the Memavira had a history. She and I were chagans for the old Memavira. Ran different games, different turts. But it was always a competition with her. See who could make more shins, who could keep the peace better, who could embarrass the other. I always got the sense she had a secret. Something she was keeping from all the rest of us. But I never had any proof. She shrugs. Not until the day she took power. She was quick, I'll give her that. Not a moment wasted. I thought she'd let the rest of us run. She didn't. When she sent bounty hunters after me, I knew the game had changed. It used to be the Chagans would get a choice. Swear fealty or leave. Because, you know, blood is bad for business. Better to keep all our knowledge alive, right? I'd have sworn because I admired her efficiency. She didn't give me the choice, nor any of them. Hmm. Tell me about the Memavira again. He's ruthless and vindictive. Be careful around her. I want to talk about what happened in Mielavest. Mielavest is gone. Dead. Is that what you wanted to hear? And too many of our siblings with it. He faces you arms akimbo. And now I'm thinking about how much I hated them, and how much I wanted their approval. Hmm, I get a choice here. They're dead now. Keep helping me and we'll avenge them. It must be hard to be a younger child. She snorts. More like a middle child at the rate the changing god is knocking us out. Hard to stand out from the crowd. Everyone else has figured out where they stand, but me? I have been struggling for years. I wanted to show these people what I could do. You're an unmitigated badass! You're the White Death! You're a killing machine! How do you not stand out? He shrugs. Too late now, I guess. Let's get back to it. Um, How are you holding up? You said that before. Don't pry too much, sister. My patience isn't limitless. <gasps> There's new questions I can ask her here. What's the history between you and Melmoth? I already know this, though. Want to know what happened with Melmoth? You want to know why I find it so hard to trust castoffs? We're all too damn prickly. Melmoth and I have had this damn feud for over a century. It could have been resolved by either one of us just opening up and saying something. But look, here's how it happened. I came back here after the first died. Since I couldn't kill her myself, I looked for something else to do with my life. Everyone here told me, accrue power, like I knew how to do that. Melmoth told me he'd show me, help me build an enterprise if I'd help him. I agreed. He taught me how to kill people. 
He helped me become the White Death. He made me famous. Then someone reported me to the levies. Maybe it was Yalan, maybe not. But Melmoth could have said something to me when it all went sour. Instead, we went to war. You've spoken now. At least you've worked out a truce. Years blaming him. Years just thrown down the sewers. Don't suppose you'd be willing to fix all that, too? He smirks a little. I hope he was serious about letting it slide away. I liked him beneath all of that. Number one, I gotta ask her, even though she just answered this. Did Melmoth have something to do with how you became an assassin? She looks down and sighs. Yes. And no. I wanted to make something of myself. Look at all our siblings, what they've done. And here I was, a simple thief, hiding in the country, making no name for myself, making no difference in the world. I didn't want to be a ruler, didn't want to be a king. I just wanted to be something. She murmurs laughter. <laughs> Talk to Melmoth. Pragmatist, not much for half-measures. He said that if I wanted to make a name for myself, use my natural talents and make a difference, he knew a way for me to help. He shakes his head. I'd fought and killed before, but it was in the heat of the moment, usually. I'd never taken money for it. My first kill for coin, it was... Hmm. She taps her lip. It was liberating. I was good at it. Oh boy. Yeah. It was like it was something that I'd been born to do. Who knows, maybe it was. Before long they started calling me the White Death. People feared me. And I was not happy. Maybe content. Her face darkens. Then Yalin, Melmoth's second, told me Melmoth was plotting against me, so I struck back at him. He stares you down, defiant. That's what happened. Whether I was right or wrong, that's history. Enough of that. You want anything else? Tell me again how you became an assassin. Melmoth proposed a working venture. I accepted. By the time I considered my second thoughts, I was already committed. Is anything new here on the... I'm curious about something. If I ask about the sorrow, for example. Alright, that's what she said before. I wanted to see if she'd say something like, Well, we just saw the sorrow up close. She said that before. Alright, that's it. Friend? I need someone to talk to. I need to talk to you. Of course. She clutches your hand but won't look into your eyes. Of course, Rin. What is it? Even though she said she needed to talk, she hesitates. It's about my memories. I... I feel like I should remember more by now. But I don't. I can't. I can't remember my parents' names. Why can't I? I can't remember why I left them, or how I got to Sega's Cliffs, or, or, or anything that's happened to me before that horrible slaver Toll captured me. Alright, so maybe Toll wasn't as kind to her as I thought. <laughs> maybe they were never real. Oh my god, I know the feels. Don't even talk to me about memories that were never real. That's that's treading into that's treading into painful territory for me. Um Yeah. That sucks. 
Sun might Sun might have had experiences with this. When you hallucinate things, you have you have psychotic delusions, and then you find out later that all that shit you thought was absolutely real because you remember it as exactly real as anything else that you remember, but you find out it wasn't real. That's rough. It's really rough. That fucked me up when I was a kid, when I was younger, when I finally had to come to accept my illness and the reality of it in my late teens. It fucked me up. I'm still fucked up from that. Fortunately, for the last quite a few years, I haven't been having any hallucinations or psychotic uh, symptoms because of my combination of medications and lifestyle have kept all that at bay. So, I'm not creating new situations where I'm having false memories, which is great. Back then, man, it was no joke. But do I want to say that to her? Do I want to... I'm going to let her live in her illusions. Even if Ren's crazy, I don't want to try to prove to her that she's crazy. I don't want to try to cure her or fix her or or get her to see the truth. Fuck that. She can live in her illusions. I will leave her illusions intact because... Because to me, that's less cruel. Much less cruel. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that. Um, I'm just gonna go with number four. Why do you think that is? Shakes her head. I don't know. The memories are there. I know it. It's like those thugs knew I was in that house on Cliff's Edge. I can feel the memories hear them, but when I look for them, they aren't there. Sounds like amnesia. How long have they been gone? When is the last time you remember remembering them? She furrows her brow in thought. They were gone when I met Otero. They were gone when I made all. They were gone when I hurt my... Touches her scar. No, they weren't. I knew my parents, remembered them in the cage. It was only afterward when I ran from Toll when I... She yanks all from her pocket and holds them in front of her face. Oh, did you know about this? I find this character so fascinating. My favorite character in the game of the companions cocks her head the way she does when she listens to him. A worried expression blooms on her face. Oh, blooms! Because we're in the bloom. Suddenly she gasps. A tear drips from the corner of one eye. Alright, so in her mind maybe we're coming up on an idea that all hid the memories from her. Which to me translates to her young mind just blocked that shit out because she couldn't deal with the trauma or whatever. You are right, Rin. No, I'm just gonna wait. She bites her lip hard. Then, why? Why did you do this? She listens more. You hear something, like a bird rustling in its egg, but you can't tell if it's from the stone or something else. Her head still cocked, Rin speaks to you, her voice strangely flat. He's been hiding parts of my memory from the beginning. He wanted me to blend in, to avoid undue attention. And he was worried. He thought if I knew the truth, I would have given up a long time ago. From the beginning. Her parents are dead? We've got we've got dead parents trauma coming out? Is that what's happening? Tell me then, she says to the stone. Her face reddens, angrier than you've ever seen her. What have you been keeping from me? She listens for what seems a long time, her expression increasingly frightened as she does. Finally, she lets her hands fall and she tells you. I ran away. I was angry at them, my parents. 
Something stupid. Something we'd fought over a hundred times. This time I left. I packed my things, took my coat, and when the moon was high, I just walked out. 25 XP up in here. Hello. I thought I was prepared. I was safe. They attacked me. Amar... No, I shouldn't say their name. Soldiers. It doesn't matter. Her knuckles whitened around the stone. I ran. They ran faster. I made a god somehow, a god of going forth. I must have cut away into this world and fallen through it. I guess it saved my life, but then... Slavers. My head. All. I feel like somebody did something to her, though, because what's the deal with the cut on her head that's been sewn up that she doesn't seem to know where she got it? I feel like somebody cut into her head and, like, altered her memories or cut out memories or implanted memories or did something. She scowls and shouts at the stone. You kept it from me. You walked into my mind and stole from me. I can never forgive you. Never. No, no, don't throw it away. You need that stone. That's 30% hide right there. Get that stone back right now. She pulls back and throws the stone as far away as she can manage. Then she collapses to her knees, her shoulders shuddering with each sob. Hmm. It's over. You remember now. And you're a part of this world. You should forgive him. That's true. She sniffs and wipes her face on her sleeve. <laughs> he broke my trust, picked it up and shattered it. Stays on her knees for a while longer. Wiping her tears away occasionally. Finally she looks over to where she threw all. He's a friend. You don't throw away your friends, unlike the way we just threw away Alagurn. He stands and walks over to the stone. He stares at it for a while, then says, I can't forgive you all. Not yet. You are my friend. She bends down and picks him up, then places him gently into her pocket. We should go, she says without looking at you. We need to go. I feel so bad for Rin. Oh my god. She's having a rough life. At least she's inspired, though. I've been, I'm inspiring her. Did you want something? She looks more pale than usual in this place. To talk about you again. Talk about all again. No. Same same stuff as before. How are you holding up? Alright, same as before. Alright, it's all the same as before. Alright, let's go ahead and pull Hometown back into the party. Very simple now. You pull the world orb from your bags. The sigil buttons rise obediently from its surface, waiting to be pressed. That's how I like my sigil buttons. Obedient. Nothing worse than an obstreperous sigil button. Let's go ahead and grab Tabir. Tabir, join me. Sure, lass. Let me find my trousers and I'll be right there. With a soft pop, Tabir appears beside you. I love the fact he just didn't have pants on because, you know, he was up to some shenanigans. Of course, if somebody called me right now and told me they needed me right away, I would have to be like, let me find my trousers because I'm in the same, in the same boat. Oh, wow. Gavin even tweeted about my stream. 
I just noticed I got a, a, a Twitter alert thing. Gavin even treated that he and Colin were haunting the Torments Twitch stream of at Fire Snake Aries, and he has a link. That's amazing. Wow, those are nice. Those guys are nice. That's really cool of them. Alright. Well, let's go ahead and put the orb away. It's a beer. I haven't talked to you in a while. Oh, they told me. He told me, don't talk to him. Talk to Dracogen first, because otherwise there's a bug. I'm glad he told me that, because I immediately would have talked to him first. Yes. What is Tabir working with these days? He's only tier 2. Oh, that's right. I've stripped him of all his gear. Looks like Lando Calrissian. Alright. Let's talk to Dracogen again. Nobody has said anything in my chat in like almost an hour. What is up with that? Dracogen. Dracogen's voice is less patient. Return again! Surely this time you bear what you promised! He sniffs the air. Alas, you do not! The time of mere mortals is not of the same scale allotted to cast-offs, friend. I urge you to speed your search. You said you had something to say to Tabir. Here he is. Updated my journal. He turns to Tabir. Old friend, let us resume our acquaintance, shall we? How is Arvin? Did you have a joyful reunion? Oh, things went badly with him and Arvin. Tabir's jaw drops. His face goes pale. I... I don't... How do you know? His eyes seek yours and mute appeal as his tangled questions take his breath from him and leave him for once speechless. The beer? Is there something more you need to tell me about Arvin? Was he in the bloom? I don't... Don't know, the beer says, and beneath his obvious terror in the presence of Dracogen you see anger and guilt. Oh, Dracogen says, clucking his tongue. I've confused you both. Let me connect some of these dangling threads. Alvin came to me a year ago, asking me about Tabir. He came to me, you see, because the two of them shared, let's call them mind link rings. Well, Tabir gave his ring to me for legal and moral considerations. Shortly afterward, he hoofed it for the city above. Foolishly, I turned the device off as I was examining it. And poor Avin thought his lover dead. He came running, begging my help. Well, it seems that Avin has broken his word to me. Tisk tisk. Avin would never do that. The beer says hotly, then flushes. He's, he's a man of his word. And well, you have to admit that you do have a fearsome reputation, and Avin wouldn't want to cross you. He taps his chin. This does present a problem, then. Arvine pledged a year of service to me in exchange for certain information. And, well, now he's vanished. I sense a Tibir-specific side quest coming up. I thought of using the paired mind link ring you gave me as collateral in order to track him down. But then I realized that anything could have befallen the poor man here in the bloom. Besides, who am I to stand between two long-lost lovers? Perhaps you might be more inclined to seek him out than I. So here, you can have your ring back. May it be useful to you. He smiles to you and bows. My apologies, but I simply had to make use of Tabir and Arvin. I do look forward to hearing of the successful resolution of our arrangement. Tabir's ring. 
ring is plain and tarnished. Kabir rubs it with his thumb, constantly spinning it around his finger. And we did not just got a quest, though. Right? No. Oh, we. Oh, because we already have the quest. It's broken hearts. Help Tabir find Alvin. Dragojin, return a ring to Tabir that may help him sense where his old lover, Alvin, is hiding. If I speak to Tabir, he should be able to guide me. Alright. Paces over a small patch of ground as though caged. Knew he was there, that he was here, and that he was looking for me. I should have. Trails off and pulls the ring Dracogen gave him from his pocket, cradles it in his palm, and meets your eyes. Heartbeat, he said. They work by skin contact, see? I'd know if he was. He bites his lip and closes his fingers over the ring. We have to find him. I have to find him. I don't understand. Can't you use those rings to sense his mind and see where he is? Right, he says with a trembling laugh. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking. Back in the good days, it'd be like, like holding hands, wrapping your fingers around theirs, right? But with their thoughts and feelings instead of flesh and bone. He shakes his head. I'd need to concentrate for one... And two, and two, I have a big old yawn. And two, I'm not welcome there anymore. He made that clear, and I don't know that I disagree. We'll find him. Thank you, he says, nodding. Just want to talk to him. Set a few things right, if that's still possible. He swallows and slips the ring onto his finger. What happened between you and Alvin, anyway? This isn't the time, Tabir says, but he glances up at you regardless. It was mutual, all right? As time wore on, we wanted different things. And I wasn't willing to... He stops himself, sighs. Leave it. Let's just focus on finding him. Can't you tell me anything about what happened between you and Alvin? Not important now, he grunts. Let's focus on finding him. Where do you think Alvin is? I'll remember that. He's... The beer begins, touching the ring on his hand and closing his eyes. His brow wrinkles in discomfort, confusion. He's somewhere in Little Nil Niliesh. Where do you think he is now? He's still in Little Niliesh. Let's talk about you. That right, he says, distracted. Ask away, lass. You look like something's troubling you. What's the matter? Huh? Tabir says, blinking. Oh, well, you caught me. I'm thinking about him. Avin. Some people just won't stay in your past where they belong. He rubs an eye with the heel of his hand. Two of us had a fine time while it lasted, and the more I pick and pluck through these memories, the more I'm thinking it would be nice to see him again, even if he's scowling. The beer sighs. That man had a beautiful scowl. I do like me a beautiful scowl. I do. I thought you didn't want to see him again. I do and I don't, he says, smiling. I stretched the truth before. Things didn't end well between us. They ended... Well, he chews his lip. They ended about as bad as things can end. But it hurts me to think on it. Perception tells me that light touches a suspicious hint of wetness at the corners of his eyes before he turns completely away from you. Can we get the single tear? Is it single tear time? I'd rather focus on the happier times, lass, he says. Avin and I, we made great stories together. Those are the ones that keep me smiling at night. Alright, I feel that. Tell me about... Actually, don't tell me about anything right now, because we've got to end this episode. So, 
Are you watching the stream? If so, hi. Don't go anywhere because I am not done streaming. I'm going to keep on playing this for a while. But if you're watching on YouTube, bye. Because that is the end of this episode. So thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays Torment, Tides of Numenera.